Welcome back to Cityscape. In today's episode of Secret People, we will cover Jack Parsons, a rocket engineer, chemist, and thelemite occultist. Rocket science is one of the most difficult disciplines there is. One would expect leaders in that industry to be empirical, stoic, and perhaps hyper-rational. But the man featured in this episode was no such thing. For example, when looking for tenants for his Pasadena home, Jack boldly asserted in the ad, quote, only bohemians, artists, musicians, atheists, anarchists, or any other exotic types need to apply for rooms. Any mundane soul would be unceremoniously rejected, end quote. Judging by this ad, one would not think Parsons was central to the U.S. early rocket programs in the 1930s and 40s, but that he was, and much more. As always, let's start with a brief background. Marvel Whiteside Parsons was born on October 2, 1914, in Los Angeles, California. Parsons was named after his father. Marvel H. Parsons, a wealthy real estate developer in Springfield, Massachusetts. His mother, Ruth Virginia Whiteside, divorced his father after discovering her husband was visiting prostitutes. No longer wanting her son to remind her of her former husband, she refused to call him Marvel and always referred to him as Jack. This name would stick with him forever. At the age of 12, Parsons attended Washington Junior High School, where he developed a friendship with Edward Foreman. These two shared an interest in rocketry and would begin engaging in homemade rocket experiments using gunpowder. Despite being only 12, Parsons also began to investigate the occult and even performed the ritual to invoke the devil into his bedroom. With the onset of the Great Depression in 1931, the Parsons family fortune began to dwindle. By now, Parsons was attending the university school, where he was a keen participant in archery and fencing. Parsons graduated high school in 1933 and enrolled at Pasadena Junior College to get an associate's degree in chemistry and physics. He dropped out after one term due to financial hardship and took up full-time employment at the Hercules Powder Company. He later began a degree in chemistry at Stanford University, but found the tuition unbearable so he returned to Pasadena. Things began to take a turn for Parsons when he and his childhood friend, Edward Foreman, attended a lecture by aerospace engineer Theodore von Karman. The two approached von Karman after the lecture, and Karman introduced them to Frank Molina, a mathematician and mechanical engineer from Texas, writing a PhD thesis on rocket propulsion. The three became friends and would apply for funding to do rocket research together at Caltech. Caltech agreed for the group to operate under the university's Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory, which gave them access to special equipment. The three focused on their distinct skill for their collaborative rocket development. Parsons was the chemist, Foreman, the machinist, and Melina, the theoretical technician. Around the same time, Parsons also met Helen Northrup, a woman he met at a local church dance and proposed marriage in 1934. Parsons, Foreman, and Melina would be known among the campus as the Suicide Squad because of their dangerously explosive experiments. After countless tinkering, the group tested their first liquid fuel jet motor at the Devil's Gate Dam and the Arroyo Seco in 1936. Three attempts to fire the rocket failed, and the fourth one resulted in a mild explosion. The groups continued their experiments through the last quarter of 1936 and finally completed a successful test in January 1937. By 1938, the group had completed their first static rocket motor, which could burn and run for over a minute. In 1939, a friend invited Jack and his wife Helen to the Church of Thelema, a religion founded by Alistair Crowley. The couple saw the performance of the Gnostic Mass and were impressed enough to want to join a church. Jack and Helen were both initiated into the lodge in 1941. Parsons' stature would rise in a lodge, and he was later made its head by Alistair Crowley himself. Parsons would become a dedicated student of Crowley, 
and expand the lodge by recruiting new members. Meanwhile, Frank Molina approached the National Academy of Science for funding to research jet propulsion. The military was interested in jet propulsion as a means of getting aircraft quickly airborne where there was insufficient room for a full runway. They gave the group an initial funding of $1,000 to research the feasibility of jet-assisted takeoff. This made Parsons and his group the first government-sanctioned rocket research group in U.S. history. The proposal led to more funding, and by 1940, the rocket research group at Caltech was given $22,000 for their experiments. By then, fellow scientists at Caltech were getting irritated by the group's dangerous and loud experiments, so they were forced to relocate to iron sheds at the Devil's Dam area. The group's aim was to find a replacement for the black powder rocket motors the military currently used. Parsons invented a solid fuel consisted of amide, cornstarch, and ammonium nitrate. The first JADO test took place in 1941, but was a failure. The units frequently exploded and damaged the aircraft. After a few improvisations made by Parsons, the second test proved a success and reduced takeoff distance by 30%. As a result, the NAS increased their grant to 125000 As the U.S. entered the Second World War, the U.S. Army agreed to buy 60 JATO engines from the group, not just their fuel. As a result, the Suicide Squad formed the Aerojet Engineering Corporation in March 1942. By then, Parsons was extremely well-respected in a rocket science community. Parsons would also make further improvisation in his fuel by combining a mixture of potassium perchlorate with roofing tar. This formulated a better version known as Galsit 53. This fuel was not only significantly more stable, but burned slower and provided a thrust that was 427% more powerful than previous versions on the market. Variants of the solid fuel designed by Parsons were later used by NASA and space shuttle rocket boosters to get a man to the moon. Aerojet's first contract was from the U.S. Navy. The Bureau of Aeronautics also requested Parsons' solid fuel type, and the Army Air Corps soon followed. This newfound credential and financial success gave Parsons the opportunity to travel throughout the U.S. as an ambassador for Aerojet. He met with rocket enthusiasts, like Carl Germer, and had several hour-long conversations with Werner von Braun. Parsons was even called upon to give expert testimony in a state prosecution murder trial. Captain Earl Connett and Lieutenant Roy Allen and Fred Brown of the LAPD were accused of murdering a vice squad officer called Harry Raymond by placing a pipe bomb in his car. Raymond had been investigating political corruption within the police department and was about to expose them. The trial lasted several months and made headline news in all the national newspapers. As a result, and due to Parsons' expert testimony, all three were found guilty and convicted for the murder. This is a famous picture of Parsons holding a mock replica of the pipe bomb used in a killing. The replica was created by Parsons himself. This trial caused Parsons to become acknowledged as America's leading expert on explosives. Back at the lodge, Parsons got involved with his wife's 17-year-old sister, Betty Sarah. Not caring too much about Helen's feelings, Sarah began to assert herself as Parsons' new wife. The couple, along with other Thelemites, moved to 1000 South Orange Grove Boulevard, a mansion where the Thelema religious followers lived in a commune. One person that would later rent a room in this mansion is L. Ron Hubbard. I have already discussed how L. Ron Hubbard would screw Parsons in another episode, so I will not get into the details here. After losing both his money and girlfriend to Hubbard, Parsons began to engage in black magic in an attempt to recover his losses. He also met Marjorie Cameron, a woman he would later marry and be with for practically the rest of his life. Parson was an habitual user of marijuana, but he now regularly used cocaine, amphetamines, and various other opiates. Meanwhile, Aerojet was now operating a budget of 650000 
and the jet fuel operations were also growing. Parsons would come to work high from drugs and exhausted from occult rituals, and his co-workers noticed. As the U.S. became aware that Nazi Germany had developed the V-2 rocket, the military gave the group a $3 million grant to develop rocket-based weapons. This expansion led the group to rename their Caltech Rocket Research Group into Jet Propulsion Laboratory, an organization that is now part of NASA even today. By this point, the Navy was also ordering 20,000 JATO units a month from Aerojet. The administrators, who by then were mostly made up of academics from Caltech, took this traction as an opportunity to sell 51% of the company's stock to General Tire and Rubber Company. They also voted to remove Parsons from the business, viewing his occult activities as disreputable and repulsive. Parson left the company with just $11,000, despite his critical contributions as a founder and technical pioneer. Affairs would get much worse for Parsons, however. After the Second World War, the Red Scare forced an investigation that caused him to lose his secret clearance due to his communist sympathies in the past. Parsons had to resort to manual labor, working as a car mechanic and bootlegging nitroglycerin for money. After testifying to a federal court that the Lima was anti-communist, Parsons once again obtained a secret clearance, which allowed him to get a contract designing and constructing a chemical plant for Howard Hughes. While at Hughes Aircraft, he was also working on a project with Israel to design and build a jet propulsion factory. To help with this research, he used his high-level security clearance to access and take home confidential documents. A Hughes aircraft secretary reported Parsons to the FBI for espionage. Military security was also called in to investigate his early association with von Braun in Germany. Parsons would again lose his secret clearance and be forbidden to work on rocketry. To make a living, Parsons founded the Parsons Chemical Manufacturing Company in 1952, which was based in North Hollywood. The company created pyrotechnics and explosives for the film industry. In June that year, Parsons received the rush order of explosives for a film set and began working on it in his home laboratory. While working on that order, Parsons accidentally dropped a concoction of fulminate of mercury, which turned this experiment into his last one. The explosion blew off his right arm. Both of his legs and left arm were broken and a hole was torn on the right side of his face. He was declared dead 37 minutes after the explosion. He was just 37 years old. Upon learning the death of her son, his mother Ruth took a fatal dose of sleeping pills and killed herself. Parsons' legacy includes many patents for liquid and solid fuel for rockets. An exhibit of one of his solid fuel motors is on display at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Those of you who want to see his work can save this location on a Cityscape app. The death of Jack Parsons is controversial. Some believe it was a suicide. Parsons was known to suffer from depression. Others theorized that the explosion was an assassination plan by Howard Hughes. Some think the LAPD murdered him due to his testimony that convicted Captain Earl Kennett. But police investigations found the likelihood of murder implausible. Many of his former colleagues described Parsons as criminally negligent when considering the dangerous nature of his work, so the cause of death is most likely accidental. Parsons' infatuation with the occult dominated the narrative of his story for a long time, but he was much more than that. He was one of the three founders of JPL, an organization that is now part of NASA and plays a critical role in America's space exploration. He was also one of the founders of Aerojet Engineering, the corporation that delivered a propulsion system for the Navy's submarine Polaris missile. Parsons also made several scientific advancements in solid and liquid rocket fuels and would perhaps have contributed much more if his path did not cross with Aleister Crowley and L. Ron Hubbard. 
Most history about NASA and early rocket engineering failed to mention Jack Parsons as a key character. But as guardians of history, it is important we do not forget. See you next time.